My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramer. Ugly my friends, I'm just trying to save you some money. My job, not just to entertain, but to educate, explain what's going on. So call me 1-800-743-CBC. Tweet me, Jim Kramer. Wall Street is addicted to trading. It's just... But if you're managing your own money, you should not be listening to all this trading advice. You can't afford to do what they want you to do because trading is a full-time job. Even many hedge funds can't do it because trading is a real hard way to make money. Trust me, I did it for 14 years. They were lucrative, but they were miserable. See... Wall Street never stops the trading stuff, though, especially on a day like today. Dow tumbling 399 points, S&P sinking 0.96%, NASDAQ plunging 1.18%. Today, well, we had a ridiculous plethora of sell-side downgrades. I want to go over some of the worst defenders because I believe they are truly hazardous to your wealth long term. If they could be right for two, three, maybe five days. Look, I, I get that today was definitely ugly. Long-term interest rates were higher. Again, oil keeps climbing. All that creates a level of calamity that merits some negative commentary, no doubt. I won't pretend that today should have been a good session, not for a minute. But I want to talk about how bad days like this one bring out the downgrades and then magnify them. And those downgrades can really hurt anyone who's trying to be a long-term investor because they're giving short-term trading advice without couching it that way. Let me give you some of the more egregious examples I saw just in this one day. First downgrade, Amazon by Wells Fargo, titled, quote, Positive revision story on pause, reducing to equal weight, end quote. Totally get it. Lots of headwinds. Stocks up huge from the so-called bad quarter when Amazon fell from 184 to 161. Since then, it's traded as high as 195. But as 186 as of last week, I, I, it's, it's time to sell. I'm not so sure. What do these analysts fear? Amazon spending a lot on a ton of initiatives. Worries about Walmart impact. So there's a slight estimate cut, too. Wait a second, I say. How many times... How many times has Amazon been up against headwinds? Do you know how many times the company's made some inexplicable moves? This is nothing new. Yet Amazon has always come back. It's in their culture. It's in their DNA. It always does. I remember a year and a half ago when I was screaming at them because Amazon Web Services was underperforming. It came right back. Last time they reported, I was in disbelief that the Olympics and the attempted assassination of Donald Trump led to a light third quarter sales guy. I was apoplectic at the Alexa losses. And what happens? Comes right back. Comes right back. So I say, knock yourself out and see it, sell it if you have to. Let me ask you, did you sell Amazon at 161 after that last supposedly bad quarter? How did it feel when the stock then bounced to 195? Once again, I think it's just a matter of time before Amazon bounces back, as usual. No hurry. Stock does seem to be headed lower. I'm no doubt about that. I get it. But sell to buy it lower? Can you really get back in that? Too hard. How about Jeffries downgrading Apple this morning? This piece certainly seemed cogent. Listen to this quote. We like Apple intelligence long term as Apple is the only hardware software integrated player that can leverage proprietary data to offer low cost personalized AI services. End quote. So far, so good, right? Then, though, quick pivot to the negative. Quote, smartphone hardware needs rework before being capable of serious AI with likely timeline of 2026 to 2027. End quote. 2026 to 2027? Jeffries claims the high expectations for the iPhone 16 and 17 are premature, and the price earnings multiple is near an all-time high. And you know what? That's all true. Apple really is facing some near-term headwinds. The the hardware may not be ready. But all this tells me is that everyone else, what everybody else has been saying for weeks now, real issues for the 16. When everyone knows there are real issues, though, you're going to have a limited window to buy the stock after the expected post-quarter weakness, unless you believe that nothing good will happen until 2026, 2027. To which I say, if you believe that story, 26, if you believe it, it means that you think Tim Cook's authorizing the sale of phones that he knows are substandard. It's almost as though the entire history of Apple refusing to issue hardware before its time never happened. I mean, it's like you can't trust the guy. I say that's some Joseph Stalin level revisionist history for you. This downgrade is betting against Apple's entire culture of excellence. Even when they argue that the valuation is too high, that presumes Apple's service revenue stream, gross margin bonanza, will somehow tape off. I don't buy it. Oh, and by the way, let's remember the Chinese government finally training the bazooka on their flailing economy. It looks like their consumers will get some free money. That's huge because Apple's got a ton of exposure to China. Hey, by the way, with all the talk about the iPhone 16 disappointing, does it matter that T-Mobile, one of the biggest sellers of the thing, told me personally that sales are good? I think it should matter. So what are you supposed to do? Sell Apple 2026, buy it back at 209 when it misses the quarter? I don't know. Is that the game plan? No change from my stance. I say own it, don't trade it. Too hard otherwise. How about DuPont? 
Barclays has disliked this story all the way up. It's Chapel Trust name. Carrying it. Well, I wrote about this morning for our, our top 10, if you get that. It's a really terrific newsletter put every single morning. It's free. Why does Barclays do this? Why did they downgrade? Well, it took it to sell after a real nice run that you wouldn't have caught a penny of if you listened to the analysts. You'd be selling it right now before the three-way breakup masterminded by Chairman Ed Breen, one of the greatest breakup artists to ever play the game. Seems crazy to me, but I guess Barclays feels that Breen doesn't know what he's doing. I wouldn't take that bet. I say buy DuPont and Luitas. We're going for the Chapel Trust. So far, we've been right. Analysts, he's been wrong. Then there's America's Best. This morning, J.P. Morgan downgrades the stock from buy and hold. Mark Express, they say, quote, represents the asymmetric risk associated with a stock trading near the high end of its valuation range with limited upside to estimates, end quote. So they say go elsewhere. Do you know how many times Amex has been downgraded, gotten right off the canvas a few days later? Do you know how many times it's bounced back almost immediately? This is the premium global credit card company in the world, and you're downgrading ahead of a rate-cutting cycle? How about some history for heaven's sake? I say if you sell it at 276, I hope you can get back in, I don't know, 264? If it reports so-so quarter, maybe you can do that. You might leave it, but you may never get back in. And therefore, you might miss a much bigger bevy of points, which is what I'm worried about. Finally, there's a piece by Barclays downgrading Netflix on slowing growth and margin erosion, both of which makes this premium valuation hard to justify. This one made me feel so aggrieved that we got a whole piece on it later tonight. Look, it's not like I'm saying go against the downgrades of one of the weakest banks like Comerica that I saw today. You can take that to a sell. I'm right there with you. I get that you might want to downgrade some home builders because of the weakness in Florida and Texas. There are a real surplus of, of homes right now in Florida. So even though history says you shouldn't downgrade the home builders in rate cycle, I get it. I'm not going to fight this one. Home prices are coming down in some parts of the country, so gross margins will be hurt, and that does knock down these stocks. But when I look at the history of this incredible bull market, and it has been an incredible bull market, it is littered with buy to hold, hold to sell, buy to hold, hold to sell. These downgrades that scare you out of amazing stocks at levels that may temporarily be too high, but will recover later. If you listen to the downgrades, though, you'll never recover with it. And that's what I care about. Bottom line, if it weren't for the steady downgrades of Apple, can you imagine how, many, how much money you would have made over the years? Or Amazon. I mean, if you just ignore the bear analysts, how much money, how much more money you would have made? At least no one said sell NVIDIA. But you know what? I bet after a day like today, that's just a matter of time. Gary Massachusetts, is Gary. Oh, yeah, Jim. Hey, I love oh, you, yeah, Gary. Thank you, buddy. Listen, uh, today I'm calling about RTX, right? I took a small yeah. position, Jim, last December. Since then, I've added to the position four times. I'm at a 30 percent, I'm sorry, 36 percent gain. Now, I acquired RTX for diversification. There's lots of things I like about this. But, Jim, it's at an all-time high and had a beat for the last four quarters. But, Jim, the analysts are not supporting the company at this time. And it keeps going up. Oh, well, right. the analysts don't understand the company as well as you do. See, that's the problem, Gary. you got a better beat on the analysts. It only sells at 22 times earnings. It did hit an all-time high today. But you know what? It's not expensive. It's got a 2% yield. Here's what I would do. I mean, if you feel so inclined, you can, you can try to cut the position back a little if it's too big for you. But otherwise, you hold on. It's a winner. And there's nothing, nothing there that shows me that it won't continue to be so. Paul in Minnesota. Paul. Kramer, you bald-headed beauty. Tell me, thank a you for question that. for you. I've been Let me get my wife on the phone for just a second. Mi- I've been buying SoFi from nine and a half dollars down to six and a quarter. I'm sitting on thirty thousand shares. I look at this as a, a home run hit and a twenty five dollars stock, but it doesn't move. Am I naive, ignorant, no. or just no. fatally no, no, optimistic? You're... You are uh, baffled, as many people are, because it's more of a technology stock, but people regarding it as a rate stock. There are people who genuinely hate this company, and it has a very big short position. But how many times have I asked Anthony Noto to come on and defend it? And every time he does, and every time he tells a coding story. So I am not backing away from Noto. I like the stock. Hey, listen, you can say, you know what, Kramer, you're just soft on Noto. Go check my record. Anthony and I would be the first to agree that that has not now always been the case. All right, listen to me. This beautiful bull market is littered with analyst downgrades. So a lot of times, if you listen to them, the stocks will just end up recovering, but without you. Yes, they could go down, but then they go back up. My advice is don't let them go. Well, man, money tonight. I'm searching for stocks that can bring you a trifecta of good yield, growth, and value. Yeah. I'm kicking you off a series with names that meet this mark and revealing the sector where two, top two live. Then, I got a battle of bull versus bear when it comes to one of your favorites, Netflix. After two analysts dropped conflicting reports, I'm taking a closer look, giving you my take. And Paychex pop, popped on earnings last week. I'm checking in on the state of small and business employment with the CEO and also, of course, looking at the stock because it has been a great one. So stay with Kramer.
Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com. We've made it through the historically difficult month of September better than ever, which is great, except now we need to contend with the historically horrible month of October. Last month, we got bailed out by the Fed's double rate cut. But there's no open market committee meeting this month, and we just got a very strong labor report that's making Wall Street wonder if we'll get another rate cut at the next meeting in early November. The interest rates just flew today. Tricky situation. One made more difficult by the fact that the average are still within spitting distance of their all-time highs. It's tough to get enthusiastic about new ideas at a moment like this, especially with earnings season about to kick off at the end of the week. PepsiCo, by the way, starts tomorrow. But there are some stocks that can absolutely work in this environment, which is why we spent the weekend sorting through the S&P 500, searching for names that met three simple criteria. Yield, earnings growth, and value. I call it YEV. Why YEV. First, we want stocks that offer better yields than you can get from the bench, benchmark 10-year treasury, which is currently a little over 4%. Second, we want outsized earnings growth, meaning better than the 14% growth Wall Street's expecting from the SP 500 as a whole next year. Finally, we want value, meaning stocks that are cheaper than the SP 500 in the aggregate, which currently trades at roughly 21 times next year's earnings estimates. You know what? That's actually a very tough set of criteria. But it gives us a list of nine YEV names that I plan to unveil over the course of the week. Now, I want you to think of them as the elite of the elite. Not many companies can give you high yields, cheap stocks, and explosive earnings growth all at the same time. So I want to start with the two that have the highest yields, both of which are big commodity chemical plays. I'm talking about Lion Del Bazel, that, that has a 5.62% yield, and Dow with a 5.13% yield. Of course, these two chemical stocks haven't been doing particularly well. But they're effectively flat for the year, trailing the S&P 500 badly at something nearly 20% of the same period. And look, Lion W. Zell and Dow both deserve to be laggers this year. These are textbook cyclicals. They boom when the global economy booms, and they lag behind the economy struggling. Until very recently, the two largest economies of the world, the United States and China, were both deteriorating. But think, think about what's happened just in the past few weeks. First, the Fed officially kicked off a new easing cycle, starting with that double rate cut I just mentioned. And then there's a clear consensus that we are going to get several more rate cuts done before the Fed is finished. Uh, Wall Street's expecting that the Fed funds rate will be down to 35 to 3.75% by next June's meeting. That's down 125 basis points from where it stands right now. What really matters, though, is that the general direction of interest rates is lower, which means the Fed is your friend. Don't fight the Fed. At moments like this, the textbook cyclical stocks tend to become big winners. If there's a perfect time to buy commodity chemical places like Dow and Lion Del Bazel, it starts when the Fed is cutting, which is right now. Second, in the past two weeks, the Chinese government has announced the most aggressive stimulus efforts that it's put in place since the end of the pandemic. And for once, China's actually putting money in people's pockets. For a communist regime, they seem to really hate handouts. But they're, they're finally taking action to bolster their alien economy, which is good news both for their own companies and for cyclical world, cyclicals worldwide that are levered to the Chinese economy including Dow and Lion Del Bazel. That's why I think these commodity chemical companies feel interesting here. A couple of weeks ago, uh, analysts at J.P. Morgan published a note on the chemicals group, basically said that they expect these companies to report week third quarter results. Remember, Dow reports October 24th, Lion Del Bazel coming on November 1st. We're not expecting anything here. Dow already pre-announced light numbers at an industry conference last month. But the analysts at J.P. Morgan went on to explain that these stocks have been what we call de-risked meaning the near-term earnings headwinds are already baked into the share price. If you're willing to look past that and see further into the future, though, Dow and Lion Del Bazel should be on the road to recovery now that interest rates are coming down. you got to anticipate, anticipate, anticipate. That makes a lot of sense to me. Perfectly jives with what we heard from Jim Fitterling, the chairman and CEO of Dow, when we had him on the show back in July. Listen to this. I think we need to see mortgage rates get to something with a five handle on them so that we can see people being able to get mortgages and being able to move into that market. When that happens, the part of the business that's slow will pick up pretty quickly, both from construction and then all the knock-on effect from appliances, carpets, and other things that go into the, into the housing market. Bingo. 
That's more or less the story here. Of course, Fitterling said all this a couple of months before Dow had to issue a negative pre-announcement for the third quarter, mostly because of the hurricane shutting down production. That pre-announcement came on September 12th, causing the stock to hit a low for the year. But since that's rebounded from $50 and change to $54 and change, do you expect that to happen during the rate cut season? That rebound makes so much sense. Everybody knows that when the Fed starts cutting rates, it's time to buy the cyclicals. It's just that these commodity chemical plays take a little longer to come alive again than, say, the housing stocks. Of course, Dow and Lion Del Bazel are very much hostage to the Federal Reserve. If you don't believe we'll get a steady stream of rate cuts, then they won't be able to hit the earnings estimates, meaning the stocks are more expensive than they look, and they could be poised for more downside. But you know what? If, like me, you believe the Fed will continue cutting, uh, then bond yields will come down too, and economies around the world will reaccelerate, bolstering the commodity chemical business as a whole, including Dow and Lion Del Bazel. Well, then you got to pull the trigger. So here's the bottom line. In this quiet period before earnings season gets crazy, okay, we got to search for new ideas. These are ideas that represent the highest quality stocks for the current moment, the ones that fit the YEV paradigm, yield, earnings growth, and value. Dow and Lion Del Bazel, they perfectly fit the bill. And as chance would have it, they're exactly what the hedge fund playbook says you should buy at this point in the business cycle. Keep watching this week, and I'm going to give you some seven other names that pass the very exclusive YEV test. Man Money's back after the break. Coming up, bulls, bears, and binge watching the five-star case for Netflix against those who fear a flop. Next. Earnings season is now right around the corner. But you know what? We're in that period where Wall Street analysts, in their infinite wisdom, pen their preview notes telling us what's going to happen. Normally, these preview notes really aren't that compelling. Occasionally, though, something interesting really does happen, like this morning when we got a genuine analyst gunfight over the stock of Netflix. Barclays downgraded the stock from equal weight to underweight. That's actually a hold to sell while keeping their very low price target at 550 At the same time, Piper Sandler upgraded Netflix from neutral to overweight. Hold the buy and took their price target from 650 to 800 Keep in mind, this is currently a $701 stock. Now, I love these analyst face loss because they help us pit the best arguments of the bulls against the best arguments of the bears. Now, it makes it easier to know where you stand given all the available information. It also steals you for something goes wrong. You've already thought about it ahead of time. Let's start with the hit piece presented by the team of analysts at Barclays. These guys argue, and I'm going to quote, Netflix's premium valuation is predicated on revenue growth being at least in the low double digits for some time, end quote. But they think it'd be hard for the streaming giant to hit those numbers. In fact, Barclays argues that even if Netflix hits its revenue targets, the stock's current valuation pretty much assumes the company can more than double its subscriber base, which is a pretty tall order. As they see it, Netflix is now a slowing growth story like that trades like a steady growth story. In their view, while the company still has levers that can boost growth, these all come with serious trade-offs. In short, after years of outsized growth, Barclays actually believes that Netflix will find it harder and harder to keep delivering, which is a problem because the stock now trades at over 30 times next year's earnings estimates. Very hard to justify that premium valuation if they can't maintain at least a double-digit growth rate. Barclays also argues that as Netflix moves from a pure subscription-based system to something more of a hybrid subscription and advertising model, and the company invests in things like video games, live events, its margin expansion will slow. You know, it does sound pretty darn grim. The House of Pain. So what about the bull case for Netflix? It's presented by the team of Piper Sailor. Interestingly, this upgrade is also based on valuation, but in a much different sense. Right at the top of the note, Piper explains, quote, our prior neutral stance was centered around valuation, but now we, appreci- we appreciate the company is expensive for a reason, end quote. Then they continue, quote, there are still levers to be pulled in the ads-free business, particularly around pricing, while the ads tier has been largely de-risked heading into next year, end quote. In a direct contrast, the Barclays downgrade, the Piper analyst says, quote, consensus margins should, uh, could also prove to be conservative in 2025 and 2026 based on the incremental margins over the last few quarters, end quote. I like this. Overall, they see, quote, we see multiple scenarios to positive earnings revisions. Ooh, that's good news. Piper also likes the upcoming slate. Now, if you're curious, I certainly was for the upcoming slate. What do we got here? We got Emily in Paris, season four. Wife loves that one. Come out in September. I didn't, the rescheduled Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson boxing match. Uh, now scheduled for November. Netflix's first ever NFL games, which will take place on Christmas. Season two of Squid Game comes out in December. And the arrival of the weekly WWE Raw program, which starts early next year. Now, personally, I can't wait for the NFL games on Christmas and Squid Game season two. That's it from this list, but don't take it from me. I'm not the usual guy. 
The Piper Sandler analysts argued that, quote, Netflix has still has levers to drive non-ads business, end quote. You can see that the company's starting to lap tough subscriber comparisons because of the rollout of paid sharing roughly a year ago. Still, they still think, though, that there's room for subscriber growth. But more important, Piper claims that Netflix has more pricing power, which means they can generate double-digit revenue growth without adding as many new people. In fact, they expect a price increase soon on the back of a very strong content ramp. Do you really think, by the way, that you would notice? I mean, please, it's Netflix. On top of that, the last time Netflix reported, they had an incredibly strong demand from advertisers. Management decided to approach the space carefully. Piper thinks there's room for some upside surprise on the ad front going forward. The work I've done on this shows you that they can target ads better than almost anybody in the world. The bottom line for Piper Sandler, and the part of the call that I find least effective is this. Quote, streaming now represents 41% of television viewing in the U.S. for August 2024, up 270 basis points year over year. According to Nielsen Gage, with Netflix being 20% of the streaming time spent and 8% of over overall TV viewing, end quote. As, look, at, frankly, as the, as the pivot continues to streaming, we got to expect the company's going to maintain its leadership position, particularly as it adds more and more live content. That's what they say to me. It's a yawner. But you know what? It's important to know that we're still pivoting. That's what these two firms are saying about Netflix. But where do I come down? All right, look, I'm going to stay bullish on this stock, just like the last time I covered an analyst duel on Netflix back in April. Since then, the stock's up more than 26%. That's right, since we got bullish, nearly doubling the performance of the S&P 500 over the same period. But let's talk about these arguments from Barclays and from Piper Sandler because they're important. First, I flat out disagree with Barclays' bearish assertion that Netflix can't hit the revenue estimates. After a period in 2022 and 2023 where Netflix did indeed miss sales numbers several times, they've now beaten top-line expectations for four straight quarters. More important. With their ad business now ramping, plus additional revenue from paid sharing plans, the company has more optionality than ever when it comes to how they're going to hit those revenue targets. And with Netflix no longer giving quarterly subscriber metrics starting next year, I think they can focus solely on hitting revenue expectations. That's the new key metric. How about the great margin debate? Well, Barclays is very negative here. Piper Sandler argues that even if Netflix can't keep expanding margins like it did this year, that doesn't mean they can't keep putting out more gradual growth. And we agree with that line of thinking. Finally, how about valuation? All right, Barclays argues that the stock's premium valuation requires the company to do certain things, and Piper Sandler asserts that Netflix is expensive for a reason, my view. I simply don't care. Maybe I'm wrong to be so blunt, but I honestly wouldn't get too hung up on the price earnings multiple for this company. You know, it's never pointed you in the right direction of the stock. What's more important is whether or not Netflix makes the numbers. If the company beats the earnings expectations, as it has in 10 of the last 12 quarters, then we don't need to worry about a stock's premium valuation. Because the share price will look a lot cheaper in retrospect. If the company can't make the numbers, then the stock's got no reason to be expensive and it's going to get hit. But the bottom line, until we hear of anyone canceling the Netflix subscriptions, maybe because of price, or about any real troubles with the advertising business, which we don't, or about the out-of-control costs of video games or live events, none of which has happened, then I think Netflix deserves the benefit of the doubt. And that's why I'm sticking with the bullish side of this trade. The bear thesis, I don't know, too hypothetical. Why don't we go to Susan in California? Susan. Hey, man, it's great to hear your voice. I watch you every uh, day. Thank you for th- Thank you, Susan. Experience. Thank you very much. What's up? But I, I have one problem. Uh, years ago when uh, Disney was hot and you were promoting it because it looked good, uh, yeah. it started dropping. And unfortunately, I didn't sell it. So now I'm sitting for all these years with a loss and sitting at 90. Uh, it's got some a lot of people on buys. But I'm thinking of selling it and putting it into a stock that may do the same thing that um, I did with PayPal, by the way. Lost a lot on that. Put it in the right. um, NVIDIA, figuring when NVIDIA ever hits 200, I'll be even. So what's your thoughts on Disney? Because okay, well, let's talk about Disney. I, I spoke with Jeff Marks about it this very morning. You know, he works with me with the Travel Trust. And I said that if we weren't restricted on Disney, I would actually be a buyer of the stock here. It's come down quite a bit. It sells at 18 times earnings. It's down today because I think the storms. But you know what? Disney is doing much better than people realize. And it's about time people started giving a little more respect. I'm a buyer of it. The analysts are dumping all over it. They're dumping over it now. I say buy more Disney. Let's go to Julie in Colorado, please. Julie. All right. Mr. Kramer, first-time caller, long-time listener and club member. Okay. Thank you for giving ind- individual investors like me the confidence to believe that I can do this. I appreciate your education. That's what I want. I want you to be able to do it. Won't always be here, but I know you will. And you're going to do it right. Let's go to work. 
All right. My question today is about Dell. In an earlier Med Money, like maybe early summer, Dell was named as a potential beneficiary of the AI trend and predicted to enjoy great growth fueled by expansion of sales from PCs needing upgrades to all this cool AI stuff. But since then, AI has dumped about uh, 18%. Now, I'm trying to be a good student at Kramer University. Right, right. So my first thought was, okay, maybe the trend was just hype. I should do more homework. Second thought was I'd jump a gun, and Dell's going to be good long term, but it's going to take more time. So um, I'm noticing that there's been a lot of insider selling in the last month. Um, I'm noticing that analysts are now supporting Dell and calling for it to be a long-term investment. So in its portfolio that's already a bit tech-heavy, is Dell a buy, a hold, or a sell? Julie, never bet against Michael Dell. I look at that stock every day and think if we didn't have so many other AI-related semiconductor and hardware names, Dell would be top of my list. Michael Dell is working very close with Jensen Wong to be able to make it so that if you want to integrate uh, uh, NVIDIA into your operation, you go to Michael Dell. I think you should be going to Michael Dell and be a buyer of more stock in Dell. Joe, in my home state of New Jersey, Joe. Hello, Mr. Kramer, and thank you very much for taking my call. Always great to hear from you, Joe. How can I help? I currently own... Visa, and with Visa set to acquire a feature space, developer of AI, should I ask mm-hmm. my position? Uh, I don't think that, look, it sells at 27 times earnings. I'm waiting for Visa to come down at a discount. You don't have that. Right now, I have to tell you, MasterCard is actually doing a little better than Visa. But no, no need to add a position on that. that that's not the right basis. Uh, just keep, look, it's a great long-term stock, and I think it always will be as long as this is well run as it is now. All right, I think Netflix, people, deserves the benefit of your doubt. That's why I'm sticking with the bullish side of the trade. By the way, I'm doing that with Disney, too, as you heard from the, from the questioner. I don't like to deal in pure hypotheticals. Much more man money, including my sweep with paychecks after last Wednesday's 52-week high. Then don't miss my breakdown of the state of specs in this tape. I'm looking closer at the tricky timing and giving you some stocks to add to your watch list. And, of course, all your calls rapid fire in tonight's edition of the Lightning Round. So stay with Kramer. Last week, we got an important update on the state of small business in this country. Uh, when we heard from Paychex, the payroll processor and outsourced human resources play, they reported a really strong quarter. Paychex delivered a clean top and bottom line beat that sent the stock up nearly 5% in a single session. I'm used to the stock going down after the darn quarters. More important, this is the number one payroll processor for small and medium-sized businesses. They process payments for one out of 12 Americans employed by the private sector. So let's check in with John Gibson, the president and CEO of Paychex, get a better sense of what's happening here. Mr. Gibson, welcome back to Man Money. Jim, it's great to be back with you. Well, John, I'm glad you're here. You've had so many good quarters. A lot of times the street just decides, you know what, not good enough. And then the stock goes up anyway a couple days later. This time it just went up immediately. So what are the chief drivers of what happened here? Yeah, look, Jim, I think we're off to a good start in in the fiscal year. We just finished our first quarter. And I think, look, we beat revenue and adjusted earnings per share. When you look at our adjusted revenue, it's up 7%. And we continue to show good margin expansion margins at 42 percent. So I think the street was very, uh, very happy with our continued progress. As you know, uh, we're now in the post-pandemic era. A lot of the government programs like ERTC that we've been working on our clients are behind us. And we really are now executing our post-pandemic strategy. And it's beginning to resonate with our with our clients. So our revenue retention continued at near record levels. Client retention was actually better, which also indicates that we have a stable small business environment. And we actually saw hiring inside our client base, all three bases, our technology client base, our payroll client base, and our HR outsourcing client bases all showed growth. And that was the second quarter in a row. So I think that was a positive side about the underlying uh a solid uh, economic situation we find ourselves in in small businesses. See, Joe, when I hear that, I think to myself, well, why does the Fed have to cut it all? I know some people are starting to think about that after that great employment number on Friday, but rates still are high relative to where, they, where inflation is at this point, don't you think? Well, I think this, Jim, I think that the inflation side of it, when we look at our wages at a macro level, 
Those have actually been under 3%, the three-month average for five months. We've continued to see that. So I think inflation kind of getting there. I think the Fed had to begin to think about the cooling of the employment situation. When you look at it right now through the first nine months, we're still seeing moderate growth, but we did see some slowing in the last couple quarters. One of the things we've seen is small businesses have struggled to find uh, and attract quality employees. And one of the things we've been focused on is rolling out products and solutions to help them do that, uh, like our Paychecks uh, uh, recruiting uh, uh, program. And those things seem to be helping our clients find employees. Now, there's something you said on the conference call that I got confused about. You said that um, you noted on the earnings call that you still might have heard the sonic boom of the pandemic and healthcare costs. That got me nervous. What, what What are we talking about there? Well, you know, Jim, as you know, we are the 30th largest insurance agency um, in the country, and we're one of the largest HR outsourcing providers in in one of our business, our professional employer organizations. We actually help our clients uh, source and provide uh, affordable health care to their uh, employees. And one of the things that happened during the pandemic is we saw a lot of labor inflation in health care, as you know. Well, a lot of those contracts are coming up for negotiation with the carriers, and now those rates are just beginning to see themselves pass through the uh, healthcare system. So one of the things we see a lot of our clients and a lot in the marketplace looking for is really making sure that they're trying to figure out ways to control their benefits costs going forward. Okay, better. Now I understand. Don't feel so frightened, frankly. I don't have a bomb. I get worried. Now, how about this? Um, what regions are really doing well? Because, you know, this Midwest is something that keeps defying uh, what I thought would be. It continues to be strong. Well, yeah, you're, you're talking about our, our employment index. And, and as I stated, our employment index continues to see moderate growth across the country. What you do see now, again, remember, we still have about 30, we have 30 states uh, continuing to grow we have a concentration of states that seem to be struggling, and those struggles tend to be in the West and the Northeast. Um, the South, which had been the historical kind of strong area during the pandemic, the Midwest was right behind it. Really, so far this year, the Midwest has taken the leadership position in terms of small business growth. Okay, so what do you say, by the way, Jim? We've got these terrible storms. What do you do for your, uh, your clients that are obviously... Uh, you know, really, um, really getting hit hard here. What do you, what, how do you reach out? What do you do for them? Yeah, Jim, you know, the first thing I, I want to do there is, you know, our hearts go out to the people in North Carolina and Georgia, South Carolina, and still in parts of Florida that are still recovering uh, from the last hurricane. Uh, we in, enacted a very extensive uh, business continuity plan. We reach out to our clients in advance, start to ro- run their payrolls. We have an entire playbook that we provide them on how to get in contact with their employees during a disaster and how to begin to reestablish and, and get b- back under it. So we already started that today for Florida. We'll be contacting all of our clients over the course of started this afternoon uh, into tomorrow, figuring out how we can help them prepare uh, for what's ahead for them. So it's been a kind of one-two punch for our clients. We're also doing a lot of things to help our employees that have been impacted from this as well through our Paychecks Cares uh, program and through our foundation. We've given $50,000 to the American Red Cross to try to help those in need. Well, that's good because I'll tell you, I, from what I'm reading and hearing about, it's far worse than we seem to realize up here. We're kind of, I'm not saying we're not paying attention. It's just there's so much craziness around the world. We're not focused on our own country, which is too bad. But I'm glad to hear that you're doing something about it because it's pretty clear that People don't know where their employees are. And people don't know whether, where the payroll is going to be. And they need something stable. Maybe it's Paychex that's doing it. Well, thank you, John. John Gibson, President CEO of Paychex. Great quarter. Good to have you on the show. Thank you, Jim. Okay, talk to you soon. The money's back in. Coming up, hit us with your best shot. An electrified, fast-fire lightning round is next. And then the lightning round is over. Are you ready? Ski, Dad, tell me the lightning round. Crazy, let's start with Tony in Florida. Tony. Hey, Jim, I just want to give a shout out to your team because they're wonderful. You know, even though you couldn't get on party, they got me with you today, and I really appreciate what they do. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. What's up? 
Oh, uh, yeah. Um, this is stock I bought last month, and I bought it, I think it almost as high, but I thought it was going to break out, but I don't see why it can not make it. Uh, it's a retail company, you know, the REIT company. They have a lot of leases with uh, everything in Vegas, with uh, Caesars and Venetian, and they even own, have uh, 33 acres. Maybe they could put a little park on there. What do you think about Vichy properties? Should I Vichy hold properties. it? They have some Canyon Ranch, too. Uh, look, I think it's fine. you got a 5% yield, uh, so it's a little bit better than Treasuries. It's a well-run company. I'm not going to set the world on fire, but it's fine. Let's go to Chris in Texas. Chris. Booyah, Jim. Booyah, Chris. What's happening? Hey, ever since I've moved to Dallas, Philadelphia has always been my team, and I love the Eagles. I love the Phillies. Really? Well, thank you for that. Man, that's, you're an outpost, a lonely outpost there. How can I help and, you? And I, 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 own, I own Z Scaler for over five years. I've had a All very right. nice profit. However, this year to date, it's down about 22%, and I'm wondering if it's time to sell. Uh, I think Jay Soldier's doing an okay job. The, the two winners in the segment, Palo Alto, which we own for the trust. And then i got to tell you, CrowdStrike's coming right back after that uh, coding problem. So uh, I like those two better than I do Z Scaler. Let's go to Guy in Ohio. Guy. Booyah, Jim. How are you tonight? I am doing well. How about you? Well, hanging in there, my friend. Uh, right. My question is about the ST Microelectronics. It, uh, it had a high of 5127 this year and a low of 2745. Right. And I got into the down point at $35, and I was curious what your thoughts on them were. I think it's fine. I prefer Micron. If that great quarter that Micron just had is still not getting the respect it deserves. Go to Melissa in Massachusetts, please. Melissa. Hi, Jim. This is Melissa from Westfield State University. I oh, have great. Thank you. I have one question for an in-class assignment. I was wondering if it is worth investing in a couple shoes of Crown Castle. Crown Castle is just okay. It's not that well run. It's got a decent yield of 5.6. I would not chase the stock. It just had a nice move up. I don't want to be there. Let's go to Gabe in Texas, please. Gabe. Hello, Mr. Kramer. How are you tonight? I am doing well, Gabe. How about you? Not bad, not bad. My question is about the stock Schlumberger with the ticker SLB. Is this a buy? Sure, sell, SLB hold has not stock? gone up nearly as much as I would have expected, given the fact that oil's up. I would buy the stock right here. It is the best of breed. James in California, James. Yo, Jimmy, chill, booyah, and go birds. Go birds, man. Yeah, I like them. Looks like those browns are uneven. Oh, yeah. yeah, uneven. I, I, I know you've recommended this. Uh, this- stock in the past, but with the pending uh, class action lawsuit against the company and with the steep decline over the last year, is New Fortress Energy a buy under $9? I am shocked at how low that is. This West Eden, he is so good. It's down so, like, like three quarters, like down like 75%. Um, I think that you have to stick with it. I've been wrong. I've been wrong in New Fortress because I believe in West so uh, closely. I'd love West to come back on the show. Let's go to Eric in Michigan. Eric. Jim, I love the show. Oh, thank you, buddy. Thank you. What's happening? I'm, call, I'm calling on Rocket Company. They've had a solid earnings in the past 12 months when rates were elevated. True. I know it's had a strong run-up in the past month, but with the Fed cutting possibly two more times this year and into 25, and the refinancing boom that's about to hit, can you see the stock going to $25 this year? Uh, that would not shock me at 17 to 25, given exactly what you described. The answer would be absolutely. I think you could do that, and it's a very well-run company. Let's go to Jim in Texas. Jim. Hey, how are you? Long-time viewer, first-time caller. I have a position called Tetra Technologies, Tetra Tech. Well, you are and a I smart wonder- man because that is infrastructure and is just kicking butt. A lot of people wish they had that stock. You have done very well, sir, in finding that one. Tetra Tech is remarkable. And even at 38 times earnings, I got to tell you, I see people still buying it. Doesn't seem to slow them down. I would take a breather, but it's been a great one. Let's go to Tom in New York. Tom. Hello, Jim. Nice to talk to you again. Same. What's up? Okay. Uh, Jim, I have a question for you. I know you're a Dell guy, but uh, I'm, yes. my question is on a little less known company, Pure Storage Incorporated. I used to follow very closely Enterprise Storage. It does its job very well. It's actually had a good run here. I think I would hold on to it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion of the Lightning Outlook. <laughs> The Lightning Round is sponsored by Charles Schwab. Coming up, speculate like a pro. Taking a flyer is okay, but do it the Kramer way. Next. 
Jim Kramer, the diehard of the dollar. Hey, Jimmy, love the show. My five-year-old grandson loves to watch your show. I have to thank you for making us money when it's there to be made. Our world is a better place with you in it. If you're going to speculate, you need to do it like a pro, not an amateur. I've got nothing against speculation, as long as you're smart about it. That means you need to know what you're actually doing. Otherwise, if things go south, you'll be caught playing a game of endless musical chairs. Lately, I'm getting a huge number of lightning round calls about some very sketchy outfits that all belong to what I call the hot money segment. The thing about the hot money segment is that there's a limited amount of capital devoted to it, not enough to go around. Let's start with the obvious, China. Right now, the Chinese government has created a situation where arguably you can't lose, at least for the moment. They're essentially subsidizing all sorts of buying of stocks, encouraging buybacks, and insider buying with liquidity support. That's how you've had such gigantic moves over there. The question is, have you missed it? That's always the key question when you're speculating, isn't it? It could have been asked two weeks ago, though, when the buying really took off in China after the government announced multiple stimulus packages. By the way, it may not be done. So what can you do? If you want to speculate on Chinese stocks up here, it needs to be with ones that can stick with you, if, if the market falters over there. Right now, you know, there are only two that I regard as safe for these purposes. One is Alibaba, the Chinese Amazon, and the other is Baidu, the Chinese Google. Why these two? Alibaba's run from $66 earlier this year, 117 today, but it still sells for 14 times this year's earnings, that's 12 times next year's. While it has a $282 billion market cap, it's also sitting on $107 billion in cash. Oh, that makes it real cheap. During the height of COVID, this stock traded at 319. And even six years ago, the last heyday for Chinese stocks, it hit 211. It's lucrative, it's safe, it's smart speculation. It still hasn't really gone anywhere if you look long term. As for Baidu, it's also usually profitable. It sells for just 10 times next year's earnings. Many are tempted to buy the Chinese auto stocks because they've got incredible EV technology over there, but the EV market's very crowded. Some are buying PDD, parent company of Temu, the popular online retailer, but it might have trouble with U.S. tariffs down the road. I say you only need two Chinese stocks to speculate on because if those two fall, you're not in the musical chairs racket. With Alibaba and Baidu, you have a real good place to sit down. Let me give you another one I keep getting. Nuclear power. I get so many nuclear questions, but the most obvious plays are Vistra and Constellation Energy. Both are profitable, but they're now very expensive. Some want to play this theme and make no mistake about you are playing. With GE Vernova, a very good company, but it would tell you that new nuclear plants, even the smaller modular ones, are still way off. You're basically buying a company that builds windmills. Okay, business. And natural gas power. But natural gas power, natural gas power plants is a great business and very much in demand, but they're decidedly not nuclear. We can't tell which companies have more de- decommissioned nuclear plants that can come back online. The th- like that Three Mile Island deal with one tower being recommissioned by Constellation for Microsoft power needs, but that's also a very expensive process. The pure play nuclear utilities are unlikely beneficiaries of the surge in electrical demand, although I will say that any power producer with nukes might want to spin them off like Exelon did with Constellation Energy two years ago. That would give us something to own. What else? People want space stocks so badly, with the most obvious one being AST Space Mobile. I think it's a poor man's Starlink. Elon Musk privately held satellite internet play. AST is a huge money loser that's going parabolic. Big insider selling. No thank you. There's no pure place I trust in the space business. What can you do? Finally, there's only so much hot money hanging around this market, and speculative stocks now need to compete with crypto. To me, the only safe cryptocurrencies that can bounce back easily are Bitcoin and Ethereum. Most of the others are junk. I buy those pure plays and not fool around with any of the common stocks associated with the, with the segment either. Just too dangerous versus these two, which, by the way, both have exchange-traded products supporting them. Let me reiterate, I have never, ever blasted speculation all the years I've done this show. I just want you to do it wisely, because with any speculative trade, there's a beginning and an end point. I just think the end point for something like a Baidu or an Alibaba is a lot further out than for some of these other red-hot plays. <laughs> I like to say there's always a bull market somewhere. I promise you to find it just for you right here on Mid Money. I'm Jim Cramer. See you tomorrow. All opinions expressed by Jim Cramer on this podcast are solely Cramer's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of CNBC, NBC Universal, or their parent company or affiliates, and may have been previously disseminated by Cramer on television, radio, internet, or another medium. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Jim Cramer as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his opinion. Cramer's opinions are based upon information he considers reliable, but neither CNBC nor its affiliates and or subsidiaries warrant 
warrant its completeness or accuracy, and it should not be relied upon as such. To view the full Mad Money Disclaimer, please visit cnbc.com forward slash Mad Money Disclaimer.